this hour. So welcome everyone to our first MLC speaker series event of the semester. Uh, I say this every time because there's always a couple of new people who haven't been to one of our events before. It's great to see um, all of you. So the MLC talks are a part of the sort of you know departmental effort to um, highlight professional development opportunities for linguists uh, beyond um, traditional um, scholarly topics, perhaps. And so we highlight and feature professional linguists, uh, folks trained as linguists who are now doing a variety of interesting things. And our first speaker uh, of the semester is Kara Schusterman. Uh, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I will let her uh, introduce herself in greater detail, but she is a fellow variation associate linguist um, from New York University who is a uh, Mellon and ACLS, American Council for Learned Societies Public Fellow, um, working at the Harmony Institute, a nonprofit organization working on media impact uh, in New York City. Um, just a couple of plugs since you're all here before we get started. The next MLC event is going to be on October 21st. We're joined by Laura Dickey, who's one who's working at Google in Pittsburgh. Um, but uh, back to Kara, welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. And um, thank you to everybody who is here. It's great to see you. Um, so before I start, uh, I know that you have seen my face plastered all over your department for the last week or so. And um, hopefully I look like my picture. That picture was taken in 2008. So <laughs> it might be, I've aged a little bit since then. And, um, and I'm now also four months pregnant, and the reason I'm telling you that is because weird things might happen during this talk, um, <laughs> and I can't control them. Uh, for example, I get really out of breath when I talk, and it's not because I'm nervous or scared of you, it's just how my breathing works now. Um, so please bear with me um, if I have weird things. And I get really, really hot too, so <laughs> I might be like sweating and stuff. But anyway, again, not nervous. So, <laughs> um, all right, so just to start out, I, I want to get a sense of kind of where everybody's at. So I know we have some faculty, some students. So how many people in this room are students? Okay, good. So like a number of you. Um, how many master's students? Okay, PhD? Any undergrads? Okay. So all, all, they're all in recitation, or <laughs> okay. um, good. And uh, and as far as the kinds of high, um, the kinds of linguistics people are doing. So how many people in here are doing sociolinguistics? Okay, so the vast majority, but you're not at the back. You're applied. Here. Applied. Okay, cool. Anyone else doing anything else that's not socio or applied linguistics? All right, good. Um, and as far as future plans, for those of you who are not in a career currently, um, how many people here are planning to pursue the academic track? And yeah, great. Probably, but I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> Jen will continue to pursue the academic track, so good news for all of you. Um, and um, how many people are interested in looking outside of academia? <laughs> and anyone, anyone who is planning to do both? Good, great. I'm pre-tenure, so yeah. <laughs> about my plan we'll, see, we'll see how it goes, right? No, it's good to keep your options open, and that's what you will hear about in this talk. Um, so to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, I'm going to start by telling you about how I got into linguistics and what I study when I was doing my PhD um, and that sort of thing. And then what brought me to a career outside of academia, how I got to that point, and um, tell you a little bit about my fellowship of this ACLS, Mellon ACLS Public Fellows Program, and also um, a little bit about working at the Harmony Institute and other nonprofits, and then tell you a little bit about what my friends are doing who are linguists who are working outside of academia, just to give you some ideas. And then some of my favorite job search tips, which just to warn you, they're all insane. So you can look <laughs> forward to that. Um, and then we'll do a little Q&A. So um, let me start by telling you about my, my 
linguistics intellectual trajectory. So I did my dissertation on Puerto Rican English in Spanish Harlem. So I was looking at how this dialect changed across some different, several generations. Um, and uh, particularly, so I was looking at English specifically, but it was, you know, a variety of English that's very much influenced by Spanish um, and very heavily influenced by African American English. And so this is because prior to working on Puerto Rican English, almost all of the work I did in sociolinguistics was on African American English. Um, and I worked on two variables in, partic in particular. So I was looking at rhythm, so PVI, um, and also the I diphthong, and how that can become monophthongal in African American English and Puerto Rican English and a ton of other American dialects. So, um, like a lot of people, nobody really grows up knowing they want to be a linguist, right? Um, in high school, I was always interested in languages. I think that's how a lot of us start. We love languages. And um, I, went to, uh, I went to college at McGill University in Montreal, for Canada. Um, a. <laughs> um, I don't even have the accent anymore. This is what Jen studied. This is what Jen did her dissertation on. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I went to McGill and I knew I wanted to study modern languages, but then I got there and they didn't actually have a program in modern languages. I actually just kind of went there for the city because I wanted to live in Montreal. And you'll see this is common in my, in my life story is that I often just make decisions based on where I want to live. Um, and so couldn't do modern languages, heard about something called linguistics, decided to try it, thought it was great, as I'm sure a lot of you discovered you know, in your own trajectories. And um, moreover, I, I found that I loved sociolinguistics. And I love the aspect of being able to work directly with people and learn about people's lives and do field work and that sort of thing. Um, and so when I, was, uh, when I was an undergrad, I started out really studying my own community, which was looking at um, Canadian Jews, actually, and um, Jewish communities in Montreal, which is where my parents were from and where I was going to school, um, as compared to Jewish communities in Ontario, which is where I grew up. And um, looking at specifically what happens when Jewish people leave Montreal and go to an Anglophone place, how does that affect um, the way they pronounce French words and that sort of thing. And so that's where I started. And then from there, um, at the time I was really kind of listening to a lot of hip hop. It was the early 2000s. Um, Nelly and Chingy were really big. That's going to be relevant in a second. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, through listening to hip hop, I was hearing all of these interesting linguistic variations that I knew I really wanted to know more about and I wanted to study more deeply. And so that, you know, really excited me in terms of sociolinguistics. And so when I was looking for what I wanted to do after undergrad, I decided I wanted to go to grad school and I wanted to go somewhere where I could study African American English. And that brought me to New York University um, where I worked very closely with Renee Blake. She was my advisor. And um, right away we got to work on something which we called the ER variable, um, which was, so in these kind of, I mentioned Nelly and Chingy. So Nelly had a song um, in the early 2000s called Hot and Her, which is for hot in here. Um, and Chingy had a song called Right There, which is for right there. So we had words like here and there that were becoming her and there, and it was affecting all, a whole bunch of words in these classes. And you were hearing it a lot in hip hop at the time, and you actually still hear it in hip hop to this day because it's really become a stylistic marker. Um, but back then we had a sense that it was uh, part of a, you know, an actual dialect, despite what people thought, people really thought it was stylistic. And so we decided to actually go to St. Louis, which is where these rappers were from, do some field work, record some people. And indeed, it was part of a dialect that had been around for decades. Um, and so that's what I did for a number of years. And after I'd kind of done that to death um, was when I was starting to think about my dissertation project. And um, 
I really wanted to do field work in New York because it's such a rich place to look at linguistics and look at language and look at accents and varieties of English. Um, and I had thought about going to visit, revisit the site of Lebeau's language in the inner city, which was central Harlem. And so I ended up going to um, East Harlem because I had a contact there and volunteering at an after school program. And um, I just never actually made it to central Harlem. And so what the result of this was that um, East Harlem is heavily, heavily Puerto Rican and has been since probably for about 60 years at least. And um, so you have generations of Puerto Rican families that are living there. And so that's when I realized there was just amazing dialects to study out there. Um, and so that's how my dissertation topic happened. And um, so during that time, I also married a New Yorker. So I knew that one thing I really wanted was to be able to choose where I lived. And I wanted to be able to stay in New York. Um, and you know, I, I knew I wanted to do something that was going to be intellectually stimulating. Hopefully, I'd be able to use my skills that I had learned in linguistics, but I knew regardless, I was going to be able to use the skills that I learned as a PhD student, because there's a lot of them. Um, so, at this point is when I really started to look at other jobs, um, and beyond kind of, you know, what I... Well, as far as kind of focusing my job search, um, I had always, even though you know, I had been in academia for so long, I had always been really concerned with making sure that my research somehow made it into the public sphere. And so part of that was I was involved in a blog for a long time. Um, it's, uh, it's, we call it Word, the online journal in African American English. It's AfricanAmericanEnglish.com. And so we would take you know, different research we were doing or our colleagues were doing, and we would put it online in just, you know, simple blog posts. And um, part of this was because when you're studying something like African American English that's so kind of loaded in certain ways, and also, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about it out there, but then there's all this great stuff that we're doing in linguistics and we're learning in linguistics that just isn't being disseminated in a way that's really helpful as much as it could be. Um, you know, there are people who are out there doing that and trying to do it and doing great work, but there's so much more we could be doing. Um, and so, you know, we were trying to contribute to that movement also uh, as much as we could. So this was something that was always a concern for me was just being able to bring research into the public sphere. Um, and so as a result, I ended up applying for a my first public humanities fellowship, which was, um, it's, some, it's specific to New York State, um, but there was, they, they picked seven fellows from different humanities centers throughout the state and kind of brought us together and they were helping us to bring our own research into the public sphere and also giving us tools and training to be able to do that kind of thing better. Um, so monetarily, it wasn't a big grant. It was like about, I think, $5,000 they gave us. But then they gave us all this amazing training. So grant writing skills, um, how to secure funding, how to build community partnerships and facilitate community conversations, um, how to write for public audiences, how to speak for public audiences. The writing part was really interesting, actually, because um, I don't know, we have such a specific way of writing in academia, and especially when you're a student, when you're a grad student. It can be, it's really interesting when you actually get someone else to read what you're writing and get some feedback, someone who doesn't know your topic and is completely outside of academia. And it's just a completely different skill. Um, so so this, was a, this was a great kind of first experience and foray into the public humanities and public social sciences. And by the way, a lot of, I don't know how it is at Georgetown, but um, a lot of people consider linguistics humanities. I don't know. I didn't really know that until I started getting humanities grants. Um, but they're very happy to fund us. So keep that in mind. Um, anyway, so 
the, the coolest thing about this grant was that it brought me into this whole new network that I hadn't been a part of before, which was humanities scholars, people doing public humanities, and um, a lot of people who were working outside of academia and could help me kind of make that transition. And so just, you know, being a part of this network was really awesome because that's when I started like kind of leveraging my relationships with people and meeting with them you know on our own time and talking about different jobs I was gonna apply for thinking about applying for and a lot of those people just were like oh I know someone there I know someone there let me give them a call um, or they had advice for me or they could tell me about people in their network that I could be connected to and so you know it's just that that whole networking thing that we're supposed to do when we're looking for jobs which I'll talk about during my job search tips um, so let me actually tell you then about some of the jobs I applied for and failed to get, um, but got interviews, because it's kind of interesting, and people ask me about this all the time. So what I really wanted to do when I finished was work in tech, actually. Um, I was really excited about the idea of working in tech, but I wanted to use ethnography skills to make technology better. Um, so I had done ethnography during my time in Spanish Harlem. I was there for three years. Um, and I just loved the idea of kind of, I mean, when it comes to ethnography, going into a community, finding out, learning about them, learning what their needs are, learning all these things, and then taking it from there. And so I thought that could be something that could be really usefully applied to the creation of technology. And I know that there are people who are, who are doing that already and people with anthropology backgrounds and that sort of thing. Um, so that was my dream. It didn't, at the time, quite translate. So some of the jobs I got close to um, was doing, this is probably the closest one, was uh, user experience research. So doing research for a big tech firm to find out you know, how people are interacting with their products. Um, that was one. Uh, however, that's kind of a field on its own. So there's like a little bit extra that you need to know. So it didn't. It wasn't. I wasn't quite ready for something like that. Um, I applied to be a program officer at a humanities fellowship granting organization. So um, that didn't get that job. But I don't think a program officer was necessarily what I was looking for. But that's something that you know people are always looking for PhDs to do that kind of work. Um, there was a giant charter school network in New York that was hiring an ethnographer at one point, and that they wanted someone to go into their schools and like do ethnography. Although I don't know if they really knew what that meant, because <laughs> I think it was I don't know if they wanted someone to spy or like whatever. It was it was kind of it was a weird gig, but I you know I got pretty far in the interview process. It didn't pan out. Um, uh, although I know they have since fired their ethnographer, so it's probably for the best. Um, yeah, anyway, New York, small town. I don't know everything. Um, there was a position as a linguistics indexer at um, a certain language association, which they're often hiring linguistics indexers, um, which is basically going through and contributing to this giant bibliography uh, of sorts. Again, probably not exactly what I was looking for, but at that point I was looking for anything or really anyone who would hire a linguist. Um, and then I applied for a lot of different uh, research kind of centric positions at different nonprofits in New York City. Um, and again, like I said, it was like I kept getting close, but it wasn't quite, th quite there. And then, um, and then this other really great thing happened, which was that I, uh, you know, Following on that first public humanities fellowship I did, I applied for this other public humanities fellowship, which is the one I have now, um, the, the Mellon ACLS Public Fellows Program. And this is, um, so what they do is they, basically they take recent PhDs, they give them this fellowship, they place them in nonprofit and government positions. So it's a little bit like a halfway house for, um, for academics who are looking to transition. <laughs> Um, but it's a halfway house in all these different organizations. And um, so it's really, it's a really great program because they get PhDs out there working in, in the working world. They give them all these, 
professional development funds, they set them up with mentors, it's a two-year fellowship, so you have two years to just kind of like explore what you're doing and figure it out and kind of get on your feet. Um, and uh, it's also really a good program because they choose different organizations every year to host fellows because they want as many organizations as possible to get used to hiring PhDs. So super cool. Um, I love everything they stand for. Um, but it does mean that my trajectory is a little bit unique because I entered the workforce actually through an academic fellowship. Um, and I know like it's not probably not that common. Um, but I can still speak to some of this job search stuff that goes on and I've definitely you know, gotten a lot of that explicit professional development because of it. So as Anastasia said, I, um, I work at the Harmony Institute, which is a nonprofit in New York City. Um, it's, we're, so right now we're, we're, we're always rebranding. So right now we're calling ourselves an applied research lab that looks at the dynamics of media and society. So media and society, language and society, not a huge stretch, it kind of, like, it worked out nicely. Um, it's, it's very tech focused. So we have two divisions within Harmon Institute. We have um, a research side and a product side. So the research side is super interdisciplinary. It's, um, you know, a lot of people from academia who come and they do research on media impact in various forms. And then we have a product side. And they take those insights and they try to build products for people to use to have more of an impact. So this is for people who want to create any kind of social change. Um, historically, we've really focused on filmmakers and specifically filmmakers who make social impact documentaries. Um, but now we're starting to kind of open that up more and working with all different kinds of clients. Um, so it's an interesting place because it is a nonprofit, but then it's also a research institution, which is not super common. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have this other aspect of like building tech products which was always something that I was looking for. Um, and so as far as what I actually do on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis, it really, really varies. Um, right now, I'm doing a lot of client services. So I, um, one thing I really love doing is, again, this, this kind of ethnographic thing of meeting with people, finding out what their needs are, um, and then just going back and trying to problem solve and figure out how we can best serve them using our skills and our tools and what we have available to us. Um, so that's a big part of what I do and what I love doing. I also do participate in the research side of things when they let me, because um, I got really excited about that. <laughs> so I just finished doing, well no, I didn't finish this yet, but we're in the process of finishing up a study looking at conversation around bipolar disorder over the last four years and how that's changed. And um, so we have access to TV news closed captioning um, from, I think from like 2008 on. Um, and so we've just been looking at mentions of bipolar in context and seeing how these, you know, how the framing around this disorder has changed over time. Um, so that's kind of, you know, linguistics in that sense, which is fun, and I may have actually kind of shaped it, moved it in that direction. Um, so I do a little bit of the research stuff, the products stuff, um, I do user research, so that, as you know, was also something I was really interested in. Um, so putting our products in front of people and asking them, what are you, what are you thinking? What do you do this? And does this make sense? And, um, and kind of, or sometimes not asking and just letting them volunteer information, which is something we're familiar with in linguistics and sociolinguistics especially. Um, so that's, a, that's another kind of thing I do, and then just the day-to-day -day that goes into planning the building of products. Um, I don't have great tech skills. I actually, so I use my professional development money to take a Python class and try to learn to code, 
and all I learned was that I hated coding, um, <laughs> so, which is not invaluable. Um, it is not for me. So I'm more on the kind of project management side of things when it comes to product and then the user research side. Um, yeah, so that's my day to day. And it's funny because when we were talking about what I would talk about in this talk, um, we, so something that came up was just, you know, uh, talk about being in the nonprofit world. And so as I was thinking about this, I realized, you know, my nonprofit that I work at is a little bit strange because it's so research focused that um, I was like, can I actually really speak to this? I don't know, but I think I can. Um, and so here's, here's what I have to say as I kind of thought about it a little more. Um, so my experience with nonprofits is that they are constantly looking for people who are problem solvers, which hello, grad students, all of you, that's all you do. <laughs> all, well, not all you do, it's a lot of what you do. Um, so problem solvers, they are looking for people who can write, another thing that you do a lot of. And they are looking for people beyond writing who can just communicate really well. And um, because you know we are forced to create so much content, I think there's a really good argument to be made for someone coming out of a master's or PhD in linguistics um, being able to do those things. Uh, moreover, they want people who are mission driven. So who are driven by something other than money. And I think it's safe to say that most grad students are not driven by money, <laughs> at least not in the humanities and social sciences. Um, we're driven by a curiosity about the world, often by a desire to make the world a better place. And that's what nonprofits are looking for, at least in my experience. Um, and so I think that it, it does make sense to go out and look for nonprofits to work at. And a lot of the jobs I applied for were at nonprofits. And um, even though you know, the money isn't as good as if you were working in tech, perhaps, or something like that, um, I, I don't know if I can actually leave the nonprofit world at this point, because I'm so used to working with people who are kind of like-minded and similar to people in academia in that we get so excited about knowledge and making a difference and changing things um, versus, you know, I, mean, I don't know what our profits are because we don't have them but you know what I mean like um, these are the things that we get excited about so I think it's a great space for people coming out of academia and um, and I do have other friends who are working in nonprofits which I'll talk about shortly um, well actually no I'm going to talk about it now <laughs> so uh, yeah so as I was preparing this talk I was trying to think about who do I know that works at nonprofits or nonprofit like organizations that came out of linguistics programs and, um, and then as I was thinking about this, I was like, you know what, let me just actually make a list of places where my friends are working, because I think that's helpful when you're applying for jobs. Um, so the big obvious one is Google. And I love how when you're a linguist on the job market, everyone's like, well, why don't you just work for Google? <laughs> yeah, great idea, thanks. <laughs> it's really hard to get a job at Google. Um, but you should try. <laughs> but don't let that be the only thing you try. Um, so I have a friend that works at Google um, looking at keywords and sale, sales and what do they call them? AdWords. She says she uses her linguistics all the time. Um, I, have, I have a number of friends that work at these nonprofits that specialize in language and communications and really helping different organizations to frame their messages. Um, in very specific ways. So Frameworks Institute, you guys probably have heard of um, since they're in the area. Uh, there's another one called Opportunity Agenda that's in New York that we work with, um, or that we don't work with, we're hoping to work with very soon. Um, and so that do this kind of messaging, and so they want people who have background in communications, or you know, you could certainly kind of parlay linguistics into that. Um, I have a friend who's a grant writer for a nonprofit. So, um, as a grad student, you probably get a ton of experience applying for fellowships and grants. And so she was able to kind of turn that into, well, you know, I can write grants for you for a nonprofit. Um, I have a number of friends who are still at universities but not teaching, 
So um, I have a friend who does pre-professional advising at NYU. Um, actually, a number of friends who do different forms of advising. And um, another one who is an assistant director of corporation and foundation relations. So yeah, interesting. <laughs> I'm, and, I'm, and, so I'm not sure exactly what she does, but it sounds kind of like it intersects with some of these nonprofit type the nonprofit type work, but at an academic institution. Um, and, um, and then I have a couple friends who do kind of more education technology. That's another really great area for linguists to look at. Um, so I have one friend who is a curriculum designer at a place called IXL that does language learning software. Um, and uh, another friend who worked for many years at Rosetta Stone. Um, has he spoken here? He has. He has. Okay. Actually, uh, yeah, probably some of these other people have spoken here or will be. Um, but yeah, so he worked at Rosetta Stone for many years doing social media marketing for them. And now he's working at a startup um, that was started by a bunch of people from Rosetta Stone. Um, here in D.C. Pedago. Pedago, yes. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and then uh, a number of people who are doing data analysis. So uh, this was something, for my job at least, um, having a background in like any kind of, um, so for me, quantitative sociolinguistics was a big thing at NYU. I know it's not as big here at Georgetown, is it? We're trying. It's just okay, Jen's trying. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so any, Get, go take her class because any kind of quantitative experience, statistics experience, jobs love that. Jobs. <laughs> um, <laughs> jobs love it. Um, but specifically, nonprofits have a great need for it and are starting to recognize that they need that, um, especially as part of their evaluation practices. So um, that will work to your advantage. Uh, let's see, someone else I know who is working for the Department of Education in New York City doing reading assessment and literacy. Um, so I hear about a lot of people who are going into working um, for nonprofits that have something to do with literacy. So that's kind of a, that's the, the quick rundown of where I know linguists work. So it's a lot of different stuff and anyone who's tried has gotten a job. So, it, it can happen. It will happen. Um, okay, let me wrap up by giving you some of my favorite job search tips, and then you guys can ask questions. Um, so the most important thing that I learned from being on the job market and coming out of academia is you have to have a really, really good narrative of where you come from, where you're going, and that, how that fits into whatever position you are applying for. I made the mistake a lot early in my job search of assuming that people could and would connect the dots, and that's not the case. You have to connect the dots for people. And so it was only, I guess, I really think it was only by the time that I got to this Harmony Institute job interview that I figured out how to do that. And actually my dissertation advisor was extremely helpful in um, you know, helping me articulate that. So that was the point at which I was really able to say, here's how I fit in. And you know, people want to know that you're not planning to go back into academia. I mean, at least if they know anything about academia. Um, that's something they might, you know, they want to know that this is part of what you want to be doing in your trajectory. Um, so articulating your value is key, is you know, really how you could summarize that. Um, so yeah, that's the number one thing I tell people. Number two, uh, start a job club. So have you guys, you, you, if you haven't talked about job clubs yet, you might at some point, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah, we will. You will. Um, so when I was doing this, I, there was another grad student in my program and we were just talking one day and we were like, we have no idea what the hell we're doing. How about if we get together every week and Skype, she was on the West Coast, and just talk about things as we figure them out. And eventually it grew, and people kept joining the job club, and so we had, the, sometimes we had Skype calls with six, seven people, 
and we were all just talking about the different challenges, so something like creating a resume. Going from an academic CV to a professional resume is really, really hard, and you need a lot of help with it, and you need a lot of help from people who are working outside of academia specifically. Um, but just being able to share tips and share things we read in books. We were both reading a lot of self-help books at the time about, about getting jobs. Um, that, that was probably the most valuable thing that I did at the time. And also when you get weird dilemmas that come up like, oh, so-and-so hasn't emailed me back, but I already sent this email, but I might have sent you the wrong email, what should I do? Having a panel of people to run your problem by is really, really helpful. Um, so we had, so as I said, our our job club ended up growing at one point to about seven people, I think. Every single person has graduated from job club and gotten a good job. So 100% success rate, and I've heard other people have had very successful job clubs. Um, so I highly recommend that. So we've since, um, our job club has since transitioned, now we call it job club pro. So that's where we, <laughs> we, we get together and we talk about um, different challenges in the workplace and so we're all women in, in the club so it's you know being a woman in the workplace and like waning in and whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> all that stuff. So it still is a useful, useful thing to have. Uh, so the other thing I want to say, so I, I mentioned networking earlier. And I do believe in networking, um, but not in the traditional sense. A lot of people hate networking, and a lot of people think they're bad at networking. And um, part of that is because they, th I think people really think that networking is supposed to be this artificial thing, where you talk to someone with the purpose of, um, you know, of getting a job, or because you want to work where they work, or whatever. I never looked at networking in that way. To me, it was getting to know people, first and foremost, learning about their lives, learning about their families, whatever people are interested in talking about, and just keeping that, just keeping that relationship and in your mind and knowing that you have that relationship at some point because you might need it. And then when you go back years later, People often remember you because you had a really nice conversation with them about something unrelated to a job. So when you do talk about a job, it goes a lot smoother. Um, but then the other thing that you can do is meet with people one-on-one -on -one just to talk about stuff related to jobs as, you know, as well as personal stuff. But I did a lot of that in the year when I was on the job market was I would just go um, you know, there were a lot of women I knew who were in professional positions. They just actually just happened to be women, but <laughs> I didn't seek them out specifically because they were women. Um, but I would, you know, go and meet them, sit at their office. We'd talk for an hour. They'd ask me what jobs I was applying for. They might know someone of those jobs or not. Um, they might give me some ideas for other places to apply. And then, we, you know, we might talk about my dissertation or how they went, got their job or whatever. And there's just always something valuable that comes out of it, you don't have to force it, I think is the main thing. I don't like forced networking. You know, keep it natural. Um, and actually, I think that played a big role in getting my fellowship currently. So I used to go to, because of my first fellowship, um, I got invited to this party by um, these, <laughs> this, is a, this is, don't post this part of the video, but, um, <laughs> I, I, would, I got invited to this party of these very wealthy donors to the fellowship. And um, so a number of people kind of in that humanities world would come to this party. And so it was really nice that the, you know, the gigs, the champagne was flowing and like, it was like really good food and everything. So the next year, even though I wasn't doing the fellowship anymore, um, I was still friends with the, with the, the um, organizers of the fellowship and I asked them if I could come to the party again. <laughs> so. And so they were like, sure, no problem. Ended up coming to the party, meeting um, a program officer from the current fellowship that I have. We were talking. He said, hey, why don't you apply for this fellowship? I was like, oh yeah, great idea, why not? And then, you know, lo and behold, the things, you know, kind of grew from there because Either way, people, it's always good to not just be kind of a, an application in the pile if somebody can actually associate a face 
to the name and know that you're out there in the humanities world and you go to events and you know how to talk to people. These kinds of things are very valuable. And so I think like that kind of very casual networking that happened, you know, led to this major opportunity. And it wasn't as if I like directly sought it out, you know? Um, okay. So yeah, a lot of it is just doing this kind of like social like work um, and, and, and having fun with it, not forcing it. Um, the other thing I like to say when you're on the job market, you kind of have to be a sociopath. Um, so you kind of have to make yourself whatever they want. <laughs> and some, even if that's not really who you are, um, it really helps just get get in the door. So this is like a famous story from my current job, oh, famous within my office. Um, one of the people who was interviewing me at the Harmony Institute, we started talking about hip hop because they were asking me what my favorite documentary was because there was such a so much done on social issue documentaries at the Harmony Institute at the time. And um, my favorite documentary happens to be. Big Pun, no, I think it's called Big Pun Still Not a Player. And um, it's about Big Pun the Rapper. And I won't get into why it's my favorite documentary because that'll take a bunch of time. Um, but basically he was like, oh, the one of the interviews was like, oh, you like hip hop? Well, have you heard Kendrick Lamar's latest album? And I was like, yeah, it's great. And like, I actually don't like Kendrick Lamar, which is like, I know a lot of people do. I, I, I don't know. Some people are going to get upset. Um, <laughs> but I was like, yeah, that's a great album. You know, awesome, whatever. <laughs> and like, so all this time, he really thought I liked Kendrick Lamar. And then, you know, we became co workers and friends. And then at some point, he was just like, and like, there were, we had actual overlapping music taste, but just not Kendrick. Um, and so eventually, I was just like, you know, Clint, I have to confess something to you. I actually like don't really like Kendrick Lamar, like, and he was like, "Wow!" He was like, "But good job in the interview." <laughs> I was like, Thanks. You can always correct things later, um, you know, as long as you don't push it too far. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> the other thing I want to say when you're applying for jobs, um, it's good sometimes to apply for jobs that you don't really want because it's good practice. It's always good practice to apply for something because then when you get to the job you really want, you will have had all this experience doing interviews and writing, you know, applications and getting feedback and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so always apply for the shitty jobs to get the ones you want. Um, don't only apply for the good ones. Um, the other thing I would say, while you're in school, it's always a good idea to gain any kind of, if you have a sense of what you want to be doing after, and you have the time, gaining any extra skills that are going to help you, like statistics, um, like coding, that sort of thing, you know, why not do it while you're still in school? Um, and have opportunities in some cases. Um, yeah, that's something I think I wish I had done a little bit more of, as, and not just kind of waited till after. Because in a lot of cases, a lot of the jobs you're applying for will require some additional skills, and then if you don't have them, you can go out and get them and take a four-week course or whatever it takes. Um, hopefully, you'll like it more than I liked my Python course. <laughs> um, and uh, always send thank yous. And um, I'm going to tell you my trick, and you can use it if you want to. Um, and this is another story of me, of my Harmony Institute application. Um, so as you know, the, the job I have and the one I applied for is called Partnerships and Engagement Manager. And um, so a lot of it is engaging with partnerships, <laughs> partners. And after my interview, I went home and I wrote handwritten thank you cards and I sent them out. And I didn't really think about how long they would take to get there or when people expected to get thank yous. But apparently on the other end at the Harmony Institute, they had interviewed all their candidates 
and they were making a decision very quickly. And they were like, yeah, we really liked Kara, but we don't know how we feel about her not sending a thank you. Because everybody else had sent email thank yous. And then literally an hour later, my thank you cards showed up on their desks, and they opened them up and they were like, done. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I recommend the handwritten thank you note, not enough people are doing it, but maybe also do an email, because <laughs> in retrospect, I feel like I cut it a little bit close. Um, yeah, I highly recommend that one. Um, and then finally, I think a lot of people tell you when you're it, like doing a job search, it's really easy to get kind of like run down and that sort of thing. Um, and so they tell you to stay positive. You don't really have to stay positive. You really don't. But you have to stay engaged. So no matter what, you have to just keep doing the stuff. Um, and that was part of what we did in job club was at the end of every job club we said the thing we were going to do before the next job club. So if you're completely run down and you're like, I can't put myself out there, I can't apply for a job this week, then just work on your resume. Just do something. You just constantly have got to stay engaged in one way or another. On that note, <laughs> this is the end of my presentation portion. And uh, we can open it up for questions now. Yeah, we're doing great on time. Thank you very much. Mm.